Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Three, two, one, and we're back. We're focusing today on how to increase, dramatically increase, your repeat referral and centers of influence business. I couldn't think of a more uh, clickbaity uh, title for this podcast. Yes, but, but that, it is what it is. Right? It is what it is. That is something that all of you, when you join our Premier Coaching Program, that's the first thing we're going to have all of you do after you do your real estate treasure map. The first spoke on your lead generation wheel, sorry for using too much uh, you know, Harris parlance on you, but the first spoke, which is your first source of business, is always going to be your centers of influence and past clients. That is what's going to, over the years of your career, going to be usually, I think, one of the least confrontational, most effective ways for you to generate leads. It should not be your only one. And Julie has some interesting statistics that are fairly new about centers of influence and past clients. You remember yes. off the top of in, your head? In fact, this is from a recent report from our National Association of Realtors, as we lovingly call it, NAR statistics. And they just said over the past six months of closings, people who actually closed, transacted, uh, almost exactly 50%, and they had two things added together, past clients plus people from your center of influence, accounted for 50% of the transactions that actually happened for the first six months of this year. So it makes sense that this would be a fantastic foundational spoke for every single one of you listening, whether you're a grizzled veteran or you just got your license yesterday or you're taking your test tomorrow, it doesn't matter. If you could choose where your next listing would come from, or if you're really new, where your first listing would come from, wouldn't you always answer a repeat or referral client? Of course you would, but why? They're easier to work with. They already know you, they trust you. You're probably not gonna compete for their business and they're less likely to throw objections at you. Also, they don't ask you to cut your commission or shoot them a kickback. Well, even if you are gonna compete for the business, you already have the in, in, you know, inside advantage, right? I mean, you, you already have the upper hand. So assuming that you don't take their business for granted and assuming you take a professional approach uh, when you're going out to obviously win the listing, let's say, you're going to get the listing because you already have the advantage. But don't just assume, and this is a big mistake, centers of influence and past client agents, you know, those of you who use that as your only source of lead generation, the big mistake you guys make is assuming you don't have to compete and you don't develop sales True. skills. You don't develop a pre-listing pack and the rest of it. And then you start losing. You know, you don't take the listing from the person that you dropped off 77 pumpkin pies to for the last 14 years. Well, and even if you are tight in their center of influence or a repeat client, maybe they've used you two or three times, their spouse might have somebody that is just as equally in their center of influence. So we always coach you guys to assume every time in every way on every appointment that you are indeed competing. And one of the best things I think a lot of you are going to rejoice over when you hear our points, which Julie's about to start on point number one is the fact that uh, really 99% of the things that we're going to suggest you do with regards to expanding your centers of influence and past clients cost you nothing. We are not big advocates of spending lots of money on tchotchkes. We're not big advocates of doing anything that's really going to be passive. So for example, you know, Julie and I bought a little ranch when we lived in Texas and the, you know, this was a little, you know, they call it a gentleman's ranch where we lived in yeah. Texas, right? And the lady we bought it from was obviously, you know, centers of influence and past client marketing based. And sure enough, on a regular basis, some little piece of junk would show up on our doorstep. She never called or made any direct contact, but hey, there was a water meter. Hey, there were some forget me not seeds, yep. you know, all this junk. And I just, I felt sorry for her because I could just had this vision of her driving around in the heat of the Texas summer, just dropping off these little plastic tchotchkes at people's houses. And she could have been at home at her own little, you know, gentleman's ranch, you know, doing direct Calling. contacts. Yeah. Calling and having more meaningful conversations, which would have certainly resulted in her having an increase in business. And by the way, also an increase in, you know, return of her time because she wouldn't be doing all that, you know, tchotchke delivering and wouldn't have to be paying for the tchotchkes. So be very clear. Everything that we are going to teach you guys to do in coaching is going to be focused on you, uh, you know, frankly, helping the most amount of people and producing the most amount of profit for your business. That is the goal. That's right. So today we're going to discuss how to create a steady flow of leads and appointments and listings from this critical source of business, your past clients, your center of influence, what you guys call it, your database. Now I'm going to do a little facting. We, we talk about this often on podcasts, but I looked up the actual exact stats. Many surveys have shown that when somebody is making a decision about who they're going to hire to provide a service, 
They first ask, whom do I already know? 87% of the time. If they don't already know someone, they then ask a trusted friend or advisor who they know, that's 6% of the time, and only after those two questions are exhausted do they then turn to an advertisement or a marketing piece. So that means that your job is to be the answer 93% of the time, so you don't have to waste money trying to be the 6% of the time. Now, we're going to play that back because that is really incredibly important you understand that. The essence of why centers of influence and past clients should always be your you know, original spoke. Or maybe you were in the unfortunate position like where Julie and I were and when we first got into real estate. We were in our early 20s and we didn't know anybody. All of our centers of influence and past clients were basically, well, we didn't have any past clients, but our centers of influence were at the same age as us. You guys get the point. Barely first time buyers. Right. So, you know, we had to create our center of influence and past client list over the first few years we were in real estate. But the moral of the story is, is that your business will always come from, or most consumers are choosing who they're going to do business with based on who they already know, or a referral from a trusted friend or advisor. So statistically, we know that less than 10% of the time are people going to choose who they're going to work with when uh, from an advertisement or marketing or branding or anything like that. That's just a proven fact. It's been true forever. Now, be very clear. I occasionally will buy something from an Instagram ad, and so maybe will you. But that's not the same as who you're going to choose for, um, you know, who you're going to choose to buy or sell real estate. That's or, because that's a product, not a service. Exactly. And so when you guys are listening to a lot of these marketing and branding people, and they're just sort of firing off all these little statistics and whatnot, they're talking about, you know, people that are selling actual products, not providing a service, not providing something like as important as who they're going to use for uh, to be the real estate practitioner. Become your own, uh, you know, frankly, become your own guru. Start running things through the BS filter that all of you guys have and you decide whether or not what you're hearing makes sense because we just told you a statistical fact. And if you want to really gut check what I just said to you, ask yourself the question, if you have to hire a roofer to fix the roof on your house today, right? How many times are you going to, if you already know somebody, a, a roofer that you, you trust, you're just going to call that guy. You're not even going to shop him. You're going to call Bob and Bob's roofing is going to come out and fix your problem. Now, if you didn't know a roofer, you don't have anybody in your back pocket that you can call, then you're going to ask your neighbor. You're going to ask a trusted friend or advisor. And then if they don't know anybody, then you're then going to maybe consider an advertisement. Nobody goes directly to ads. They always go through those first two filters and that's how most people make their decisions. That's called human behavior, and you're not going to change that no matter how fancy your brand is. Now, is there a place for branding and marketing in your real estate business? Yes, but you have to put it in perspective. You have to understand what we just shared with you. Then you will not have unrealistic expectations of what you're going to get from your advertising. That's right. Don't spend 90% of your time and money trying to become part of the 6% that is only turned to after they don't already know you. This is also something that's important. If people get angry, frankly, when we say marketing and branding is the same as advertising, and it absolutely is the same as advertising, here's why. If you stopped putting money into your marketing and branding, you would stop getting phone calls just exactly as if you were buying an ad. Some of you will rationalize, well, I mean, I'm going to put up a billboard and I'm not really expecting to get any direct calls from it. It's just going to be a marketing and branding exercise, brand awareness and the rest of it. All right. So, you know, what then comes from it? Nothing. There's no direct marketing and average. There's no direct leads that will come from that. And if you take that billboard down, how quick does it uh, do all uh, at sort of any sort of, you know, brand awareness or lead generation happen? Immediately. You'll immediately lose um, any benefits from that marketing and advertising effort. It just goes away the second you stop doing it. Anybody who sold real estate in a marketplace for any amount of time, let's say you were, I'll give you Julie and I's exact example. So we were very successful in the market we sold real estate in. We sold thousands of homes over about 10 years. And in that market, um, we did have in some of our markets, brand awareness, if you want to call it that, we had market dominance. When people went to list their home, they called us uh, automatically. Our coaching business took off. We were, we were looking for bigger horizons. And so we, quote unquote, sold the business to somebody. And th that person you know, decided to do it his own way, stopped doing all the, you know, essentially the marketing and the branding that we had been doing in that particular marketplace. In other words, the advertising, the postcards, the other things we were doing. And within probably six months, the business dried up. It was Tim and Julie who, because that was advertising. So no matter how much you think you have brand awareness, if you stop putting money and time into that brand, 
the leads will stop flowing. Again, it's called advertising. That's different from centers of influence and past clients. Now, there is a way to, you know, there's a place for marketing and branding, but if you're going to lead into your business and think that that's going to be the thing that's going to, you know, create all the inflow of leads for you, it will take too much time and cost you too much money. It'll be too speculative. So if you're really serious about helping people and make money, do things in the right order, right? We don't say marketing and branding doesn't work or isn't useful uh, or isn't worth doing, but make sure you do things in the right order. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to have the business that never generates consistent business that's going to be all based on buying business from advertising and all the rest of it. And you're most likely not going to stay in business. Very well said. So back to our past clients and centers of influence, your favorite lead source. If it isn't now, it will be after this podcast. Now, how do you systematically get more out of that, out of your database? Well, there's three specific things. And again, this is just exposing you to the deep dive that we do in premier coaching. So take notes. Uh, this will get you started. So number one, of course, have an organized database with names, numbers, email addresses, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and other support information on each person. You don't need a fancy CRM. Stop making that your excuse. Use KV Core, for example. Uh, um, everybody in eXp has that, and some of the other brokerages use KV Core as well. But call each person to update the rest of their profile. It's a great excuse to make that first or next contact. Use your Ford conversation outline, that's family, occupation, recreation, dreams, to get them updated. That's a great excuse to call and get that database organized. Here's a mental exercise for all of you. The greatest salespeople, the greatest, most successful, profitable salespeople in the history of salespeople have always had the fewest number of leads. Why? And this, go, this flies exactly the opposite direction of what most of you believe to be true. The more leads you have, the more ineffective you are at pre-qualifying and setting appointments. True. And if you're uh, dripping on leads that might someday, hopefully in the next year or years, uh, transact with you, you've got to realize it is largely an, an exercise in futility. Why? Because people's lives change, but mostly because those same people are in a thousand different drip campaigns. You're not just the only agent that's dripping on that agent, your videos and the rest of it. Some of you, and I do think it's cool, don't get me wrong, have these CRMs where you'll send them different emails and videos and the rest of it, and you can actually see who's engaging most with your content. Look, stop spying on them. Stop, uh, you know, Covering. Yeah, exactly. Stalking. And stalking. Thank you. And actually pick up the phone, call them and pre-qualify them. Stop waiting for technology to do the work for you. Actually do the work yourself. And then again, the, if you have a ton of leads, it's because you're not actually picking up the phone and proactively pre-qualifying them to find out what their level of motivation is. You only really are going to make ever money from the people that are the A leads. And so stop trying to make C leads into A leads. It's an exercise in futility. And it really, the, the insidious part of it is, is that some of you take this great deal of pride in having these massive databases and that uh, instills a false sense of security. And that is what causes you not to actually pick up the phone and do the real work. You're waiting for those people to contact you. You've somehow, and the industry's done this, institutionalized the idea that you actually doing proactive lead generation and pre-qualifying is somehow inferior to people calling you. Why? Why would that possibly be true? It doesn't make any sense. So do yourself a favor, learn how to pre-qualify, learn how to meet, have meaningful conversations. I promise you, you will not come off as a pushy salesperson. I promise you, you will actually feel proud of yourself and you want to do more often as you see yourself helping more people and making more money. So point number two, we're talking about systematizing your approach here. Speak with, Tim just talked about this, all of your contacts regularly. Note takers, underline the word regularly. That means face-to-face, voice-to-voice, real contacts. A contact is a conversation with a decision-making adult about real estate. Refer to our coaching and podcasts about the Ford system. That's family, occupation, recreation, dreams. We've done entire podcasts on that. So for example, if you have 200 people in your database and you speak with... 10 per day on work days, you can actually speak to 100% of your list every single month because there's 20 work days in every 30 day period. 10 contacts per day means you get through that 200 person list. Now, what would that do to your repeat and referral business? Now, if 10 is too many, even making five contacts per day will have you speaking with 100% of your list every 60 days. And as Tim just said, a smaller list is better. That's why I'm using the example of 200 quality people in your database. So let's break that down, Julie. So the sure. theory is that 10% of the 200 people will do transactions with you per year or are going to do a real estate transaction. This is Julie just said. So that means hypothetically, you're going to have 20 
uh, transactions lurking in your database of 200 people. Uh, now, again, the fallacy in that is that those 200 people are not in other agents, you know, centers True. of influence of past clients list are not tripping over other agents when they're going to open houses and whatever else. So you are still competing with those people, even if you're in your list, even if uh, I'm sorry, they're in your list, even if you've been dropping tchotchkes on their doorsteps, you need to learn to pick up the phone and have meaningful conversations. And guys, that's the easy part. And that's what we teach you to do in uh, Premier Coaching. We give you scripts. We tell you what to say or how to say it. We want you to internalize the script. I'm sorry, memorize the script, internalize the script. And we do want you to personalize the script. Don't read the script and go right to personalize because you don't know what you're removing or editing. Right. That's a huge mistake. So I'm going to say it again. When you read our scripts, when you join Premier Coaching, we want you to memorize the script first, then internalize it. It actually starts to feel like it's your own words and your own thoughts when you internalize it. And then personalize it. Don't do it the other way around. And by the way, you can join Premier Coaching for free. Scroll down. The link is below. You can join Premier Coaching for free for 30 days. And yes, that does include all of the first level of Premier Coaching. In addition to that, a daily semi-private coaching call with a Harris certified coach. It takes 17 seconds for you to join. I timed it. And when you join, you will have immediate access to a lot of the scripts, a lot of the systems, real estate, treasure map, everything you need to have to take your business forward immediately. So scroll down, click the link, join Premier Coaching now. Point number three, Julie. Okay, the third part of your system is to expand your center of influence systematically because, as Tim just said, 10% of the number of people in your database will do business with you or refer business to you every year, assuming you're communicating with them. Again, if your database is 100 people, you'll have 10 fairly easy deals, assuming you're being regular with your communication. 200 would be 20 transactions and so forth. We talked about smaller being better. So they'll know you when you call them and being able to talk to them every month, every two months, at least every quarter. So how do you expand your center of influence? I do work with coaching clients about this. The coaches talk about this on their daily semi-private calls. Three specific categories to uh, expand your center of influence on purpose. Some of you guys are not doing deals because you hide out in your home office all day, every day, and you're not around anybody. So the good news first, we're not wanting you to go out there and, um, again, make yourself uncomfortable and leverage all your people you know from church, synagogue, or mosque, or the gym into just thinking of you as just nope. there to basically soak them for their real estate leads. We want you to be you doing what you already love to do around the people that obviously have the same interest as you. And then the, natu then the natural output will be the real estate conversations. That's right. That's why we have scripts. Okay, so... Part A of expansion of your center of influence. This is uh, number one for a reason. I call it things you like to do anyway. Your hobbies, sports, arts, working out at a gym, or going on, an, on organized hikes. You're going to be around like-minded people talking about mutual interests and using your Ford script. It'll be natural in that environment. You can use meetup.com to find things that interest you. You can do a 10-mile radius search, 20 miles. You can you know type in your interests. Try out new clubs to expand your contacts. I, I put this number one because you're more likely to actually do it regularly. Things you like to do anyway. It, if, yeah. if you're a super big introvert, you just got to write down the things that you're interested in that are like, maybe you just basically spend all your time behind your computer screen or hiding out from people. Well, I got news for you. There's other people just like you that are doing the exact same thing. Yeah. And there maybe their online way of connecting is on, you know, uh, some Facebook group or whatever. Well, if it's a local type thing, maybe you all meet up for coffee or kind of expand it that way. The easy buttons are uh, to where you're going to have essentially put yourself in groups of other people that have like-minded interests as you are the things that are already organized and you just have to show up. That's, that's, right. that's the reason church, frankly, is one of the greatest places mm -hmm. to make contact centers, you know, centers of influence past clients, because you already know you got a whole bunch of things in common with them. But same goes with, you know, Orange Theory or same goes, you know, a gym, all those types of things. So just put yourself in a position where you're around playing golf. Hell, I mean, all kinds of things. Yeah. Car shows. One of dog, my coaching clients. Dog parks. Yeah. She, she gets so much business from doing stuff with her kids' school, the PTA meetings. She's a room mother. You know, you you run into the same moms all the time. Of course, they're talking about real estate, talking about kids. These are nice, organic conversations where you eventually talk about real estate. You talk about what everybody does for a living, how's the market, all that kind of thing that we've talked about on uh, the Ford podcast. Okay. You, what's amazing, actually, is how easy it is to generate leads when you're, I mean, we make this, We. I said, we, Julie and I don't sell real estate. 
but it is rare that a week goes by where just being us around people, you know, at the gym or just wherever, where we don't trip across a real estate lead that we refer off to, yeah. mainly to a premier coaching client. That happens all the damn time. We don't even look for it. But people associate, uh, they don't even know what we do for a living, you know? So they associate us with real estate. So they, and we haven't ever like overtly like, no. here's my business card. Uh, it's just because we, you know, well, people are comfortable see, talking about it. That's yeah. Right. And they see us a reliable, you know, source of asking advice on real estate. And did you hear this? And did you hear that? And we trip over leads constantly. Well, I'm working on a podcast. Remember, we talked about uh, some people think they're just more lucky than others. Well, it's called being more present, being more situationally aware about the fact that there are leads everywhere. You know, you could be standing in line someplace. Certainly, you know, open houses, agents could be more proactive about. I'm doing podcasts and all these things. Well, but, but you know, yeah. you just said something. I, I can't let it go by. So sure. you you are in a business. You are all blessed to be in a business where you're surrounded by people, humans constantly. And here you're, you're selling something that all of them need, right? Mm -hmm. A place to live. And I want you to think about what I just said. And I want you to think in your mind how few other products on planet Earth are something that people, everyone needs, Right. Look, you need to live someplace. Obviously, God bless the homeless. But the reality of it is, is everyone needs a home, a condo, apartment. It doesn't matter. They're going to need a place to live, to rent or to buy. Everyone needs a home. You're selling something that everybody needs. Listeners, can you think of another product mm -hmm. that's like that? So for those of you who think there's a scarcity of opportunity, it that's your thinking, honestly, not to you know hit you with a mindset club, but that's the reality of it. It's this. It's your thinking that there's not enough leads to go around. It's your yep. thinking that there's a lack of opportunity. That's not true. That's the biggest, most amazing thing about real estate is you're surrounded constantly by people that will that are yeah. I'll sell my house for that price, or I'd love to upgrade my house, or I'm thinking about buying an apartment, or I'm thinking about. Da, 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 da. It is endless the number of people that you're around constantly that would love to do a transaction, and will bring up actually talking about real estate with you. You'll bring up. They'll bring up real estate stuff. So guys. Stop getting your minds in these places where you think you have to be buying your business. You just have to be yourself talking about real estate around people that, frankly, are going to be very interested in hearing what you have to say. Which is everybody. Which is everybody. <laughs> you just have to realize it. Okay. Again, we're expanding your center of influence on purpose. We talked about things you like to do anyway. Then part B is business networking for the sake of networking. This can be Business Network International. That's BNI, Chamber of Commerce. Toastmasters is great because you're forced to actually speak in front of the other members, entrepreneurs clubs, investors clubs, and so forth. So that is business networking where nobody's going to be weird about you talking about what you do for a living. They're going to expect it. They expect it. And in, I think my, my favorite of that is Toastmasters because I've had a lot of introverted clients force themselves to do Toastmasters and feel more confident speaking as a result. Okay, then C, charitable events, auctions, food drives, toy drives, fund drives, fundraisers, school and church events. I have a lot of coaching clients doing this right now. This has lots of side benefits. A lot of uh, wealthy philanthropist type of connections can happen through um, doing this type of charitable stuff. Now, this is third simply because it's not as regular, right? You might do three or four, maybe once a quarter, some kind of a charitable, charitable event. Some of your brokerages are involved in charities. You can certainly do that. Uh, but it's third because it's less regular. So your job is to not pick and choose between A, B, and C, things you like to do anyway, business networking for the sake of networking and charitable events. Do all three of those. And get a calendar. First of, all, first of all, write down the things that you're already involved in. Write down the things that you'd like to be involved in. Or try out. Or try out. Get a calendar and then you know figure out like where are this. For example, I remember when I started coaching Rob Johnson, I did this exact same exercise mm -hmm. with him. Yep. He's the number one uh, agent in Greenwich, Connecticut. And we wrote down the things that he was involved in, which was like nothing. Right. And then what we did is we uh, wrote down the things he wanted to be involved in. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot. He wanted to do this. Like it was a you know shooting range, a cigar club. And maybe the cigar club is the only thing he was already doing. I don't remember. Just all these sure. sort of social stuff. Greenwich, Connecticut type things, you know. Of course. And we wrote them all down. And then what he did is he grabbed a calendar and he calendared out when he was going to be at those particular places. And he got business. He started picking up business from all of them. Nearly immediately too. Yeah, nearly. Well, in the cigar thing, I remember him telling me that at the cigar thing, you might have a guy that's like a billionaire hedge fund guy. Mm -hmm. And then the, there'll be like, um, you know, somebody who's like a firefighter. They all just sort of had that common interest. That's that, the point of it. That's the thing that common interests do. They remove all the social, I think, normal. Like, for example, if you guys go to a dog park, 
you know, you're going to be <laughs> admiring their dog. You're going to be, you know, the whole thing. It's a complete level playing ground. A play, it's a level playing field where people can have these normal conversations yes. with all, all the social pretense. Without the awkwardness of not knowing each other, right? And you will have conversations with people sometimes. And when you put yourself in these environments and, you know, you exchange information at the very end, or maybe you do that after you see them a couple of times, you know, a text or whatever, just to, maybe you take some pictures and you want to email them or you want to text them. Well, then you discover the person is like, you know, in charge of the HR department, your local massive, you know, employer. Those types of things happen all the time as long as you're proactively, situationally aware and you're putting yourself in a position. Again, mm -hmm. do the things you're already doing. Just remember that your highest and truest purpose is to be of service to other people and the mechanism for you to do so is going to be helping them with real estate transactions. And being around more people is the point here, right? Yep. Okay, so you mentioned that a second ago. Get into the habit of adding these new contacts to your smartphone and emailing their name to yourself so you can get them into your CRM. Not everybody carries business cards around. Add a note to your contacts. My phone is full of these uh, to remind yourself how you met them. For example, Sherry Seller, met at Orange Theory, married, three kids, and a fish, moved to Austin from Chicago. Something like that so that when you do your calls, remember we talked about making actual contact, you have more things to talk about. Right. And uh, so even to keep this super simple for those of you who are really technologically impaired, right? <laughs> right. I'm actually partially including myself in on that. Yeah. So one of the easiest ways to actually keep track of your centers of influence and past clients is going to be a combination, believe it or not, of three by five cards, a little you know box to hold your three by five cards. And you're going to divide those three by five cards up by into 12 month segments or not 12 month segments, but by 30 day segments. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have three by five cards and you're going to have, let's say you're going to be calling them 20 day uh, for 20 days a month. And then, you know, these five are fitting in on this, you know, that, that first Monday of the month, second, uh, first Tuesday of the month, first, you guys get the idea and organize yes. them that way. And then every time you call them, write little notes. Write little things that are going on in their lives. Memory joggers. If, if you want to stalk them a little bit on social to find out if they posted anything that maybe merits a, you know you recognizing for that, then go for it. Um, and then also, I do use, personally, I use uh, SMS a lot, text. So when you're texting somebody, you know, obviously you're always looking to do something of service to people. So you're going to text them just some video that you found that was motivational. You're texting them some quote that you found was motivational or just stuff like that. Um, and then when you do that, it keeps track of all the conversations, obviously, in your text. You guys get it. So you don't have to have these overly complicated systems. Okay. Now, here's the thing that's great about the actual 3 by 5 cards. I know that sounds super old school, but we have a lot of coaching clients doing this. I get pictures of them from the coaches, okay? So here's what you do. You don't just have one box of those 3 by 5 cards. You have that where it's organized maybe by letter with your notes, and then you have an empty box next to it. Every time you make, say, five contacts, you take those cards from the left-hand box, you put them in the right-hand box. There's something to the visual accountability of that and touching that. It's a game. It is a game. You're gamifying it. You're seeing that, okay, well, it's the 15th of the month. I'm actually halfway through that box, and now I've got three new leads to show for it. This is working. Now I'm going to make five more calls today. Now, the only, I would say, critique I'd have of that, and frankly, it's not really a valid critique, is that you might want to be in the habit of calling them every month on the same or contacting them every month on the same day. But really at the end of the day, if you, you know, are organizing yourself so that as long as you get through the, you know, moving them right. from one box to the other every month, you're going to end up at the same place. Make the contacts. Yeah. Making the contacts is really the bottom yes. line. No, when you see guys, there's something almost spiritual that goes hand in hand. When you see yourself, hear yourself, feel yourself, doing the real work of real estate and you start getting the natural feedback from people who are giving you praise for providing them something of value. Because when you're calling them and you're using our system for centers of influence and past clients, you're not asked, you're, guys, I promise you, you not even, you very rarely are going to have a real uh, overt, uncomfortable conversation right. that will result in them saying anything other than, than yes. They're not, you're not saying, by the way, this is a business conversation. You know, who do you know is thinking about buying or selling real yeah. estate? You're not doing that. You're bringing something of value. And it's almost like a lot of you guys are thinking, well, I'll just delegate to, that to my drip campaign. You certainly can. And maybe you should do the drip campaign and make the calls. 
but the drip campaign is going to be maybe 10% as effective as actually making the direct contacts. Mm -hmm. That's right, because you don't even know if they got your drip campaign. If you don't believe me, listeners, here's what you should do. Those of you with big drip campaigns, you're walking around all prideful and you want to brag about your 15,000 people in your drip campaign, Mm -hmm. take maybe 1,500 of those people and then do a little scrub. Find how many of those people have actually transacted during the same amount of time they've been in your drip campaign and be ready to essentially have the epiphany that, hey, guess what? Tim and Julie were right. Yeah, and I often do this with coaching clients well, that, that come to us with these ginormous databases, right? So I ask them, if I were to just call 10 of them randomly and ask them who you are, could they tell me? <laughs> I mean, or are they just random people that you've thrown in there, right? So I think we need to end this, this podcast with a really important point, and that is this. Remember that in order for everything we talked about on this podcast to create a predictable, duplicatable source of business for you, You must make more contact more frequently to achieve that flow of leads. Now, in coaching, we have a 12-month center of influence plan that we go through in much more uh, in depth. There's a lot more to this. You can be doing uh, center of influence, past client appreciation parties, more charitable events yourself. There's more to this. But the summary of everything we talked about and this section of coaching is you have to make a lot more contact in more places more frequently and actively build your database and go to, like you were talking about, Rob, it's not just doing one cigar club every six months. You've got to go there regularly and actually get to know people, become comfortable talking with them, being yourself and talking about real estate. If I were to go back to our real estate careers, I would do two things immediately. One, I was, would make sure that you and I have a great expired system from day one, because that's immediate business. And number two, I would make sure that we were way more involved in everything that we talked about with like five times the center of influence. That is the mistake that you and I made. And we didn't figure it out until we were in the business for like three or four years. And I think we spent more money than we would have on speculative things than had we been better from the get-go. That's right. And that's the reason we speak from personal experience. And Grizzled Veterans will tell you that too. A lot of our coaching clients will say, you know what? The biggest mistake I've made is blowing off my database. Well, what's the old saying, right? The smart man learns from his mistakes. A brilliant man learns from the mistakes of others. Yep. Well, Well, there you go. (laughs) If you're learning what mistakes to avoid, (laughs) you've come to the right place. So listen, guys, thank for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Please do the right thing and give us a five-star review on iTunes. And please also remember to include um, a little comment about why specifically you love this podcast. This podcast is downloaded by tens of, well, I mean, I don't know if I didn't tell you this. It's been downloaded, I think over like 40 or 50 million times. That is a lot of podcasts. Not today's show, granted, but all the <laughs> but previous podcasts. Show. We have thousands of past podcasts. So yes, thank you to all of you for being such loyal uh, podcast listeners and helping us be in alignment with what our highest and truest mission is, which is being of service to all of you. Now, please do thank us. How about that for an over ask <laughs> and give us a five-star review with a great comment over on iTunes. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one.